When I came out to California, uh, I decided to leave home at 18 years old. I was getting right, I was a couple of months before 19 years old. So I, I left home in uh, 1959, early 59. And um, I had just turned 19 years old. I wanted to leave. I started planning it when just about the last part of eight, my 18th year, uh, saving my money and preparing to leave. So when I ended up in Los Angeles um, with $9 in my pocket in a city I had no idea where I was, I was about as far away from home as I could be, with $9 to my name in downtown Los Angeles on a Friday night. And I, I took one look at Los Angeles downtown, and I said to the bus driver, I said, where do people live in this city? Where do people who are regular, normal people? I'm not staying down this place. <laughs> and so he said, well, there is a nice bedroom community uh, out in the valley. And I said, what valley? He said, well, I'm going out there. It's called the San Fernando Valley. Uh, and I said, well, I only have $9. He said, oh, don't worry. i got to go out there anyway. Just get on the bus. So I did. I got back on the bus. And so we now it's about 12 o'clock at night when we left the bus station in downtown L.A., and I got out to uh, the valley, about uh, 45 minutes later, I'm out in the North Hollywood. And I got off, uh, it was about 1 o'clock in the morning. I have no, no idea in the world where I am and what I'm going to do. And um, so I started sleeping in industrial waste cans, the big blue uh, industrial waste cans. I roamed around the city for a couple of hours, and I found a little... Uh, construction, no, not construction, uh, industrial park. And one of the companies there was a paper company. And so they, all their big blue trash cans were had just paper. And so I figured, well, that's better than sleeping in garbage. So I was sleeping in the, in them, in the, uh, in the containers on paper. And I did that for about three nights. And, uh, and then I started getting desperate because the nine bucks is gone. <laughs> And um, so I, I, it, it occurred to me, I'm going to have to do something because I'm going to starve. So the next morning, I got up, crawled out of that trash can, just a 19-year-old kid on the bum. And, uh, <laughs> and um, there was a, and in that little industrial park was a, a lot of little shops, but one of them was open. It was a machine shop. And, uh, and so I went in, I walked in, and and to look, uh, you know, told the guy I was looking for a job, and he said I was just getting ready to put an ad in the paper today for somebody. So he says, "Yeah, I, I, I you know, I was just getting ready to put an ad in the paper. So, so why don't you uh, figure?" And I said, "And he said, but I'm, I don't want anybody in here till next week, till Monday. So come back on Monday and start work then." And I said, "Oh, I'd be happy to." I said, "But also," and then I told him, "I said, but I, I, I you know, I'm broken. I have nothing." And he said, oh, I, I, I've been there before. I've done that, too. He says, so he reached in his wallet and pulled out 100 bucks and 520s. Well, back in 1959, 520 a 100 bucks for a kid. That was a lot of money. I was shocked at that, absolutely shocked. Uh, 20 bucks would have been great. He gave me 100 bucks, 520s, and I couldn't believe it. And I said, this is very generous of you. He said, oh, you'll be back. You'll be back. <laughs> Anytime you get hungry, you'll come back. So he says, and I need somebody. So, um, so then I walked uh, out. Then I left, and I walked about a block, and there was a room for rent a block away. So I rented a room. Uh, it was a really nice little room. It was upstairs room, a big picture window, so I could see the city. And I'm only a block away from work, and I got a hundred bucks in my pocket. And uh, I thought, well, uh, that wasn't bad. I, so. From that point on, I started having extraordinary other world experiences. Uh, it was coming continually. Uh, one thing that actually happened that changed my life, that really was what I would call a, um, a peak experience, was while I was there at that, uh, in that room, 1959, uh, I I walked downtown. I was about three blocks from downtown. There's a little Mickey Mouse, no place. You know, North Hollywood was just a little tiny little three or four blocks of shops, and that's it. But there was a restaurant in, in town, so I walked down 
one, one Saturday morning to town, and um, the restaurant was filled. There was no place to sit except one seat at the counter. And so I took a seat at the counter and sat next to me. I'm 19 years old. And sitting next to me was a girl about 17 or 18 years old. So we got to talking and come to find out she only lived about two blocks from me. And I only lived about three blocks from town. She had walked downtown, so had I. So then we hung around town for a while, and then we decided to walk home. And so we started meeting on Saturdays and Sundays. I'd just meet her in downtown, and we'd hang out together. And then uh, when we walk home, she lived two blocks past me so that I never walked home with her to see where she lived. I know it's only a couple blocks, but I'd never been there. But she knew where I lived. So one night, a few months after I knew her, one night she comes over to my place, and she says, my dad wants to talk to you. And, of course, I wasn't interested to talk to any girl's father. And no, I said, I'm, of I'm not, not interested to talk to him. <laughs> and um, got nothing to talk to him about. And so she said, no, my father is very important and very interesting man, and he has something to tell you. And I thought, that sounds interesting. Okay. So I walked over there with her. Well, and I walked up to the door, um, she was with me, and he happened by chance to be coming out of the of the door, and he saw us. And the moment I saw him, I got a, a reaction. I got a spiritual vibe, so to speak. I, and the hair raised up on the back of my neck. I got a spiritual feeling that was very powerful, very uh, and and it was involuntary. But my spirit picked up something on him, and I immediately stopped and he looked at me and he he motioned to come on in and i knew there's something about this guy that i don't know what this is i don't know what i'm getting into here but i can feel it there's something about him and my girlfriend said come on so we we went in the thing i noticed about the father instantly <clears throat> was that he did not make any normal human moves. Everything he did was calculated. I just realized I knew that. Everything he did was calculated. He knew exactly what he was doing. And I watched his mannerisms. I watched his, the, 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 uh, you know, the way he moved, the way he talked. Uh, this was a very strange man. But what I was feeling off of him, I loved it. I couldn't get enough of this. A strange occult mystical man, but I loved it. I don't know who this guy is, and I don't know what he's into, mm -hmm. but I'm fascinated with him because I'm feeling it. And so um, he, he motioned, come on in. So we went in, we sat on the sofa. He sat on one side of the sofa, and I sat on the other. And my girlfriend and her younger sister, Mary, about 10 years old, uh, they sat on the floor, and the mother was in the kitchen, and he was, uh, we were just talking small talk. He's asking me, he said, my daughter tells me she met you downtown. Yes, and, and you, uh, you're you working now? Yes, and I'm, and so it's just small talk, and we were talking. Well, I was beginning to feel a little better about him because he was talking about normal human things that I could relate to. Mm -hmm. But I knew there's something around about this guy. I don't know what it is, but there's something about him. And so uh, after a few minutes of talking, he just very nonchalantly said, remember when you were back in Florida and your dad built a new back porch? Remember when your dad tore down the old back porch and built a new back porch and your uncle helped him? And he used green lumber because it was cheap. It was cheap lumber and he used green lumber and it smelled funny. Remember when he did that? Do, 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 do. Yeah, that scared me. <laughs> oh, that yeah. really legitimately <laughs> scared me. Who is this me. guy? So yeah. this guy knew that he knew, and and he said, "Well, did did you did he do that or didn't he?" And I said, "Yes, he did." And he said, "Well, how in the world would I know that? How would I know that?" And he says, "And then you got up out of bed. You were you were eight years old, and you were supposed to be in bed. And one night you got out of bed, and you went out on the back porch." And the moon was full. You remember that? And I, I do remember that. I said, yeah, I remember. And he said, what did you do? And I just looked at him because I didn't want to show tears in front of my girlfriend, but he was frightening me. 
And he said, I'll tell you what you did. You, you sat on the steps <clears throat> and you talked to God, didn't you? And what did you say to God? You looked at the moon and you said to God, what did you say? And I just looked at him. I didn't answer him. And he said, well, you talked to God, didn't you? I said, yes, I did. And he said, well, what did you say? And I didn't say anything. He said, okay, I'll tell you what you said. You said that you wanted your life to be important. You wanted to do something important with your life. You wanted your life to mean something. Is that what you said to God? And I said, yes, that's what I said. And he said, well, how would I know that? How would I know any of this? And I said, I told him, I said, I don't know how you know that. And he said, I know, because I was there. We were hearing you. And I said, what do you mean you were there? There was no one there. He said, no, you didn't see us, but we were there. I mean, how did I know all of this if I wasn't there? Now, were you scared at the <clears> time? <throat> when he... I was scared. I didn't know what the implications were. But he was right. He was on target. Uh, and so he, he basically he said that I was there. And then he said, and we've been watching you from birth. We've been watching you. And I said, what do you mean, we? And uh, you've been watching me. He said, well, everything I said happened. Did it happen? Yes. Well, how would I know if I wasn't there? And I said, I don't know how you know that. And he said, I know that because we were there. We've been watching you. And then he said to me in front of my girlfriend, why are you in California? Why did you come here? What possessed you to come to Los Angeles? And I said, I don't know. I just had to come. He said, that's right. We brought you here. Because, after all, you did ask God to let you do something with your life. Is that what you said? Yes. Well, then we're going to give you a chance to do something with your life. Was your girlfriend at the time listening to yeah, this? Yeah, she's and... sitting right there with her, with her sister, 10-year-old sister, and Mary was sitting right there with her. Wow. So he said, um, you've always been interested in UFOs and aliens and all that kind of stuff, haven't you? And I said, yes, I have. And he said to me, we know that. And he said, uh, would you like to see some UFOs up close tonight? And I said, yeah, I would love to. He said, I can do that for you. Come with me. So we got up. The two girls got up. I never saw the mother that night. But the two girls and myself and the father got up. And we walked out into the front yard. And now it's about midnight, North Hollywood, 1959. And he looks up into the sky and starts inaudibly talking. His mouth is moving. He's obviously talking to someone. But you can't hear him. And then he looks at me and he said, they said they'll be here in a couple of minutes. They're coming from Griffith Park area, going north, and they'll be here in a couple of minutes. <laughs> and I said, who? And he said, us. We're here. You're interested in aliens and UFOs, right? When you said you wanted to see some uh, UFOs tonight, yes. Well, then just wait. They'll be here. And so I am swear to God, uh, maybe a, a minute and a half to two minutes later, there were three beautiful disc-shaped craft in a triangle formation came from Griffith Park area from south going north and as they came over North Hollywood all three of them stopped right over the top of us and they were almost not quite but almost the size of a full moon in the sky so they weren't just lights they were circular round disc-shaped things that were glowing but what I remember about them most vividly is that they were all three identical. On the bottom, it was like divided into six or eight slices. And each slice was a different color. And they were circulating the colors, but not so fast as to blend the colors. And they were circulating. And the one thing that stands out in my mind about that event that night was the colors were laser colors. They were not just oranges and blues, but they were brilliant colors, brilliant blues and oranges and greens, and circulating, all three identical, beautiful, just breathtakingly beautiful, not one sound at all. And I stood there staring at these three things, and I looked down at my girlfriend, <clears throat> and her and her sister are just looking at me, as if, you know, they see this all the time. They just want to see how I'm reacting. Yeah, I was going to ask uh, about that. Yeah, you know, they, they, they're not impressed at all, but they're looking at me to see if I'm going to be impressed. And the father's looking at me, very condescending, looking at me like, uh, well... Now what do you want to say? Now, now, now what do you want to do? <laughs> Ta-da! Did I say that I could bring them? Well, there they are. And, and I was standing there looking at them, and I thought to myself, absolutely brilliant. No sound, and they just sat, all three just sat there. 
And then he looks up and he starts talking to them again. And then he says to me, he said, they said they're going now. They're going north and they're going, but they all, they'll, they'll be back. And so they did. They started to move very slowly. And now instead they're watching them as they went out north and went over the mountains and they're gone. Not fast. They just moved along. They were gone. And I said, my God, that was beautiful. What, what, who are you? And he says, we've been here for a long time. He said, then you ask God to let you do something. So we're going to let you do something. And what we have in mind for you to do is not going to happen to the very last part of your life. So for four-fifths of your life, just go out and live. We will see to that, that you will meet who you're supposed to. You will learn whatever it is you're supposed to learn. We will train you. And, uh, and whatever you're supposed to do and learn, we will see to it that, that you meet who you're supposed to. Because we have something specifically for you to do, but it's not going to be to the very last part of your life. And I said, what is that? He said, well, it's not important to discuss it now. All you need to know is this, that when it comes time for you to do what we have brought you here to do, you will know what you have to do. You will understand by that time uh, what is going on and what you have to do. And uh, you will have us uh, there behind you to see to it that you will accomplish what we want you to do. And the one thing he told me also, and he says, don't worry about what is to happen in your life. We will decide at, at what time you are to do whatever you're going to do. We'll decide where you're going to go, what you will learn, and what you will ultimately do for us. We've already decided that. And so he said, now tonight I'm going to start you on your journey. You have to start somewhere, so I'm going to start you tonight. I'm going to give you a gift. It's a book, and I want you to read it. It's called The Complete Works of Charles Fort. F-O-R-T. The Complete Works of Charles Fort. There's a Fortian society even in England today. Charles Fort's book is just phenomenal. It's, uh, it's, a very, it's actually three books in one. The Complete Works. He wrote three large books and put them in one volume. And basically what Charles Fort did is he spent most of his life uh, researching strange phenomena that's never been explained by anyone. There's all kinds of strange stuff goes on in the world, but his book is a collection of strange, off-the-wall stuff that nobody has ever explained and is not explainable. All kinds of strange stuff that's happened that was documented. But what makes his book, Charles Fort's book, so important is that he footnotes almost every paragraph. Every paragraph is footnoted. Tells you where he got the article, who wrote it, what name, what paper, what date. And then he tells you just briefly what the article is about. It is a mind trip. Stuff that's happened all over the world that nobody has any explanation for period. And that's what he did. He collected thousands of cases of strange things that just challenge your imagination. And, and, to, and basically what this book was doing was just making you aware that the whole world is not what you think it is. Well, There's for, stuff going on all over the world. You have no idea in the world. Well, that's, that's where Einstein gets into the different frequencies and the vibrations. Meaning, yeah, and, you know, and, we're, and we're, other dimensions. Yep. Parallel universes. Parallel universes, yeah. There's so much. Yep. And our so brain much. can only comprehend, let's say, frequency A, where there could be 20 other frequencies. Exactly. 20,000. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's true. How, As, Jordan, how old were you when that, that experience happened? 19. You're 19 years 19 old. 19 years old. Now, and, what about the girlfriend? Did you stick around with her, or was it well, time to... Yeah, we became very good friends, and so uh, maybe a couple of months, less than a couple of months, I'm sure it was... I went over to their house. Sometimes I'd go over there on the weekends, and he and I and the and the mother and the girls, we would take off and we'd go up to Palmdale. Now, that's back in 1959, 53 years ago. And there's only a couple of warehouses out there, military and that kind of thing. This is like 50, 60 miles north of Los Angeles. And we'd go way out into the desert. And I remember walking out in the desert with him, and the girls would take off with their mother, and they were roaming around. He and I would go to um, uh, caves 
and he knew right where they were. He drove right up to them. It was the caves going into the ground. One of them had tracks going down, so it was obviously a mining hole. And we went down there. We went way down. We had the flashlights with us, and my girlfriend went with me about halfway, and then she got spoofed and decided to want it out. And so we went on down further, just the father and I, until we hit water. And he told me, he said, yeah, they were digging down here and they were mining and they hit water and they all died and they're all dead down there. And then other ones, we would, he would stop at, we'd, uh, we'd get out <clears throat> and he would show me, we'd walk up to the opening in the ground as some kind of a, like a little hill and on the other side of the hill would be a hole. And we'd go around and I'm looking at this little you know, a hole in this side of this little hill and we'd go down there for a little bit with the flashlight and obviously somebody made that hole, somebody made that entrance into that hill, and it, we could shine the light down and see us going down further, and he said, this is as far as we could go. We can't go any further. Yeah, now Jordan, what was the man's name? You know, obviously he was very influential in your life. You've got to remember the guy's name. Back when your old girlfriend at 19 walks you back to her house and you get the chills up your spine. Or is it better that we don't know his name? Yeah, I guess that's probably the key. I mentioned his name before, but I'd rather not now. All right. I already did in the past, but I shouldn't have, but I did. So whatever is whatever. When was the last time you talked to this girl? Or oh, I, no, oh, that was 50 years ago. Wow. So once... Uh, uh, she's gone. She left uh, three weeks out, uh, about a month after the last time I saw her. You know, I only saw the family about three or four times after that. And where did they go? I have no idea. They just walked off and gone. They walked off and didn't even tell me they were going. She didn't even come to tell me they were leaving. One day, they were, I went over there on a Saturday morning to see them, and the house was totally empty. They're gone, and that's it. And never to see them again. They're just wow. gone. So after that trip to Palmdale. That was it. They're gone. Pretty much. Never to hear from them again, never to see them again. But uh, now, looking back on it, I understand it. And now I understand. He was here to do his job. His job was to recruit me. He had did that. He locked me in. There's no doubt about it. No doubt about I'm it. I'm sold. You're done. He's gone. Good. He's on to whatever else he has to do. He's gone on, moved on. So we don't know what happened to the girlfriend. Nope. No wow. idea. Well, You know, the first time when you met this guy... You were talking about UFOs, or I think the second visit at the at the girl's house. No, that the, was the first visit, fir I think. First visit, yeah, the first and, visit. And he called the UFOs. <laughs> that light, the the UFOs, when they came and went, I mean, I could just imagine this. You're 18 years old. You got some girl you think you're dating, and her dad's out in the backyard. Instead of telling you he wants his daughter home at 8 o'clock, he's telling you there's UFOs, and come take a look. Yeah. They'll yeah. be here in a minute. Yeah. We've been watching you for a long time. And he says, uh, so would you like to see some uh, UFOs up close tonight? And I said, yes, I would. He said, well, and his words were, well, I, I, that I can do for you. So come with me. I'll do that for you. And so we go out in the backyard and be damned if he didn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's classic. <laughs> now, awesome. Uh, what I find really neat about that is you go home after that, you take a shower, you get in bed. You know, the next day you see your girlfriend. You yeah. Know, did, did she ask you anything? Like, you know, what did my dad and you talk about last night? No, or? she no, was right she there was beside right you. There. So the, she was right there with me the whole time. Uh, her and her sister. Her sister was Mary, and uh, and her sister was about ten years old, and she was about sixteen, something like that. What's her name? And her, her name was Sharon. 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 And uh, and that was a mystical time. I mean, she was a girlfriend. Just met her. Just met her father, who blew me away. Her father made such an impression on me because it was not a, a, a normal human I was in the company of. And so his very presence in, you know, just stayed with me. I, I carried that, that strange feeling I got when I first met him. It just stayed with me. All the time I was, after I met him, it was just playing on my mind. This guy is not from here. He's not of this world. And, and and yet, he was just an ordinary kind of guy, just very, very ordinary man. But my God, the stuff he would tell me. So after that night, you kept on oh, yeah, dating for, the girl. And yeah, she was... sure, for another couple of months. 
I'd see her every every other day, and then on weekends we'd meet in downtown North Hollywood. So what'd you talk about? The latest movie? Yeah, just latest movie and kids stuff. And no, then, no, 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 no. But, but but I'm just saying with with my girlfriend, it was normal. It was just a normal relationship. A young guy meets a young girl, and uh, and so it was all just normal. Uh, but but she you know she was not extraordinarily uh impressed with any of this because it was her father you know, she looked at me the night we saw the ufos she i i was staring at them and and as i said they were about almost almost the same size of a full moon so they're not just like lights these are actual full moon size uh three of them and they're circulating colors, and so I'm standing there next to the father, and he's looking up at them, and I'm looking up, and then I look down to see my girlfriend and her sister. They're looking at me, and the look on my girlfriend's face was she was saying, yeah, that's my father. That's it. You know, that's him. You're, you're seeing it. You you think you're seeing something? You are. That's them. Did you ever ask the girl, like, what her dad did for a no. living? Uh, you know, is he... Uh... <laughs> You know, uh, I know it, I know what he did for a living, but uh, but it was very mundane, very ordinary. So very he's your ordinary. average kind of uh, just your average kind of guy. Wow. And, and and did she when you guys were out on dates? Did you ever uh, mention the UFOs or? No, I don't think so. I don't think we ever talked about it. It was just like uh, it's so hard to believe. Cause yeah, like I'd be like, I need to know more about this. I don't recall having long conversations with her about her father and and what happened. It's strange, but as a kid, I mean, I was only 18 years old, but I did at least have the presence of mind to know that what has just happened, what I saw, he was able to make happen, and he knew all kinds of things about me that nobody should know, no one. 